Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 50. Don't ever go with the flow. Be the flow. Jay-Z. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to Indie Film Hustle TV and check it out. Well, guys, we have made it. This is episode number 50. I am so excited. This is a special episode. Thank you so much for all the support you guys have made. Bulletproof Screenwriting, one of the top four or five screenwriting podcasts on Apple Podcasts. So thank you so, so much for all the support. And I've got all sorts of stuff lined up for for you and the Bulletproof Screenwriting podcast community and tribe it is coming just keep an eye out towards the end of the year i'm busy right now i got some bunch of stuff going on as you all know but i got some plans for you guys i've got some plans to take bulletproof screenwriting up another notch so thank you again so so much and if you guys have not checked it out and i advise all you screenwriters to check it out head over to filmtrepreneur.com or a little hack is filmmakingbusiness.com. It takes you to Film Entrepreneur, and it will show you that's a new podcast, that's a new website, and what I teach there is how you can turn your filmmaking into a business, and I truly, truly believe that every screenwriter listening needs to do their own thing. Don't wait for permission to do your art or wait for someone to give you an opportunity. You got to go out there and take that opportunity make your own films, make your own businesses based around your own art, and Filmtrepreneur will help help you with that without question. So filmtrepreneur.com or filmmakingbusiness.com and subscribe to the podcast, listen, there's new stuff there every week, so definitely go check it out. Now, today on the show, we have mythologist and storyteller John Booker, who is the author of multiple storytelling books like Storytelling for Virtual Reality, Best Practice Guides to Sex and Storytelling, Masters of the Cinematic Universe, and Storytelling by the Numbers. John is fascinating, man. He really goes deep into the storytelling alchemy and what it really means to pull out an amazing story. I absolutely had a ball talking to John, so much so that we actually did a bonus episode that you can listen to on Indie Film Hustle's podcast episode number 334, about how to actually shoot and write a sex scene, which is a fascinating story in and itself. But in this episode, we go deep into the alchemy of storytelling, which is fascinating. And John and I just go deep down that rabbit hole and have a ball. Knowledge bombs were dropped by the ton. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with John Booker. I'd like to welcome to the show John Booker, brother. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, it's my pleasure. I've been a fan of what you've done here for a long time, and it's a real honor to be on the show. Oh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. So before we get into it, man, how did you get into this ridiculous business we call the film <laughs> industry? 
Well, it's sort of a funny story, actually. <laughs> um, I was involved in music in high school, and I thought music is what I wanted to do with my life. And I went to college, and I decided, you know, if I'm going to go into music, I should learn how to be an engineer, you know, somebody who sits behind these big production <laughs> boards. And so I, I looked at my college catalog, and it said they had something called the recording arts. And I said, excellent. That sounds great. So I, I signed up for the first class, and the first day of classes, they pushed a TV camera out onto the floor, and I realized I had actually signed up for this coursework in film and television. Recording arts meant visual recording, not music. And I was too embarrassed to say anything, so I just went you know, through the first courses, and I found out that I loved this medium. So I began making short films and writing screenplays and, and, and creating work. And um, I, you know, began to realize that this is actually something people do as a career. And I, I knew I wanted to tell stories the rest of my life. And so this uh, this medium sort of came and found me. Basically, and I'm, and I'm assuming you've you've gone through a couple of uh, landmines and trenches while working in the business. You've. You've taken some shrapnel along the way. My God, man! I uh, I, I could tell you stories all day long. Uh, I, I, I the first time I arrived in Hollywood, the very first job I got here mm -hmm. was working on a reality show called Flavor of Love. Oh my God! And okay, do you stop right there? I yes. saw I saw the three seasons. Okay, uh, you're you're. I okay. was I was a fan of Flavor of Love. I'm sorry, everyone listening. Do not think any less of me. Now, this was a darker time in my life where I, I was not educating myself as much as I should have been, and I was vegging out, and I was obsessed with Flavor of Love, and New I, I, York, and yeah. and the what was that, the Brett yeah. Michaels thing I saw right afterwards. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Rock of Love. Oh. Yeah. I worked on all those shows, man. <laughs> I love New York, uh, Rock oh. of Love. I worked on all those shows, what was it, and the, I worked as a production assistant okay. just at the lowest levels. And man, I could tell you stories, just war stories from those shows. But I got to tell you, it also gave me a taste for what working in this business on a daily grind is like. Oh. And, you know, I, I sort of began to love this idea of just being on sets every day mm -hmm. and the way that, you know, the, the producers of the show were crafting something that was tremendously entertaining. Now, like you, I'm a bit embarrassed about it. When I was working on it, I wouldn't even tell my mother what show I was working on because I didn't want her to tune in and watch it and be so disappointed in what, me. You mean to tell me that that show wasn't real? Oh, my <laughs> God. And, and, <laughs> some of the finest writers in Hollywood crafted the storylines that you saw on TV. <laughs> that is that is remarkable. You know, you know, and, and there's no I I've done a little bit of reality work, but mostly in post. I, I no actually argue no, I actually was a PA on some Nickelodeon reality shows yeah. back in the day uh, when I first started out. But there's nothing like being on a reality show to kind of it's you want to talk about getting shrapnel. Right. And you want to talk right. about heartening that 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 shell around that skin, man? Working in reality is like yeah. oosh. It's rough. Yeah. It's it's a rough scenario for any yeah. for every and everybody involved, from the it PA is. to all the way to the top, because you know a lot of times you're not working with professional uh, professional you know uh, talent, right? right. And uh, all the egos <clears throat> get a little bit out of control sometimes. <laughs> It's a hustle for everybody. The yeah. talent, the crew, everybody is on a hustle and everybody is just trying to make this something that will be successful so everybody makes more money and gets more work. Oh, it, it's yeah. sort of an environment completely crafted around fear in many ways that, you know, this is going to be a big embarrassment or it's going to be a career killer mm -hmm. for a lot of people rather than a career maker. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, there are reality shows that are fantastic. I mean, and yeah. there are Emmy Award winning and things like that. But like I even did a, I, <laughs> my, one of my short runs in post, I did, a, I did a color grading on a like bridal dress show. Like, you know, you wear the dress or you sell the dress oh. or you make the dress. <laughs> I, I lasted three or four episodes before I just like, I can't, I just can't. 
<laughs> this is the most unprofessional situation I've ever been in. And I mean, and I and I work in independent film. Like, I mean, I would think like 15, 15 different camera setups, different color spaces, different yeah. every I'm like, do, do you guys even like have you even like taken a YouTube course on how to shoot stuff? I couldn't I just couldn't oh, it's insane. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> So all right, so you well, definitely did you see that old documentary, um, um, American movie about oh, the it's a fantastic movie. Film? Oh, it's a yeah, fantastic. Love that, love oh, it's that. Fantastic, fantastic. It, and it probably is the closest thing you'll ever see to how reality shows get made. It, it's it's you know twenty seven different camera setups with every uh, color balance and f stop known to man. No one knows. Uh, no one cares. People coming in and out of the project. It, it, it is a very very close uh, representation of what making a reality show is like. And uh, what was it called? American 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 uh, movie. Yeah, American movie, not American movie. American movie. Anyone who's listening. Go and rent American movie. It is arguably one of the most stellar documentaries on the independent filmmaking process ever. And it's yeah. just so entertaining to watch. Brutal. So, it's it's also brutal to watch. It is. <laughs> it's like watching Ed Wood. Remember when you saw Ed Wood for the first time, the Tim Burton's yes. Ed Wood movie? You're crying. You're just like, if you're a director, you're like, but just give him some mud. Let, let him make his movie. Well, anyway. it, and would you also not say that, like, after watching that, there's no excuse for me not to go make my film after Absolutely. watching what this guy goes through to make his? Like, this guy's got it way worse off than any situation I've ever been in. If he can do it, anybody should do it. I mean, we could we could go down this road of conversations in regards to Ed Wood and and how fantastic his films were in in the yeah. way that he made them, but that movie, the the Tim Burton movie, you sit there going, oh my, like you know, getting a whole bunch of dentists together and like literally putting together plastic plates to to yeah. make saucers, and he had no understanding of any sort of aesthetic or quality, right. um, but man, did he he made up with it with passion. Yes. Just, Passion, passion. <laughs> Another movie everyone should go watch, Ed Wood, starring Johnny Depp as the uh, the infamous Ed Wood. So let's get into it. So I know we because I feel that we can talk about this for a while. <laughs> we, we, we're going to have a good chat in this episode. I have a feeling. So you are a mythologist, if if, if I may quote your website. Yeah, mythologist. So yes. what is a mythologist? Well, you know, first of all, it's someone who goes to graduate school to study mythology, somebody who, uh, you know, devotes their time, effort, education, finances, you know, to the study of mythology. And I later this year am completing my Ph.D. in mythology. And the reason I became interested in that was I wanted to learn about the stories behind the stories. What are these stories, you know, that keep appearing um, in, in different places around the globe throughout history. Why, for example, do we keep telling the story of Cinderella in a million different cultures throughout history over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. Why do we keep telling the story of Hercules? Uh, you know, we, we've got basically every uh, movie with The Rock or Vin Diesel is another version of the Hercules story. Mm -hmm. So why do we keep telling these stories over and over again? I wanted to learn about that. So I went and spent several years of my life, um, you know, taking these classes and reading these books and uh, listening to the greatest mythologists in the world talk about um, why human beings keep being drawn to these same narratives over and over again. And of course, we end up studying a lot of the, the what many would say was the greatest mythologist, Joseph Campbell, yeah. who had such an influence on George Lucas in the creation of the original Star Wars, which being a Star Wars fan, I was familiar with Joseph Campbell. I knew that Star Wars was based on this mythological idea of the hero's journey, and I wanted to know more about that. And I, and I think, you know, in the last few years, um, there have been a people there have been a lot of people who have, uh, you know, anytime somebody finds value in something or really likes something, there's like a whole group of people that rise up that want to tear that down and want to 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 talk about why that's not, uh, you know, a good thing or a helpful thing. Right, right. Um, and, and you know what? Um, I, I really have issue with with people that make their whole careers or make their whole online presence about trying to tear down someone else's work. 
Um, I feel like uh, the the value to the hero's journey is um, it, it's tremendous. And it doesn't mean that every story that's ever, you know, hit the screen needs to be about the hero's journey. As a matter of fact, Joseph Campbell was a guy who's he was not prescriptive in what he was saying. He didn't say in order to tell a good story, you need to have these elements. He was being descriptive of the stories he had saw throughout the centuries and throughout history of what had worked well and what had um risen up in storytelling, you know, in all these different cultures throughout history. So it wasn't even meant to be a prescriptive thing. Um, you know, it's not trying to make storytelling formulaic. What it really is, is getting to the base psychology of how human beings solve problems and the way that we put that in narrative form. Yeah, there's, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm wearing a Lucasfilm t-shirt and I'm also, you see a giant life-size Yoda in the background. <laughs> so you, you know that I'm also a Star Wars fan and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm also very familiar with Joseph Campbell's work. Anybody, anyone who's a screenwriter should at yeah. least read The Hero's Journey yeah. or at least The Writer's Journey by Chris Vogler. Yes. Uh, that is uh, amazing as well. It is it is remarkable how we continue to tell the same stories again and again. And I think it was the fir the first time I ever really understood that we were telling the same stories again and again is when I read Sid Field's book. Yeah, uh, that was the first time it. I was like, I think late, maybe first year out of yep. college or out of high school, excuse me. And yeah. I read. I was like, wait a minute, you mean all movies are like? And then you start going <laughs> back in your head of like. Yeah. This movie did it too, and this movie did it too, and this movie did it too. Yeah. There is a, there is a structure that goes all the way back to uh, the Greeks, and obviously yeah. farther back, but the Greeks really took it and ran with it. Yeah. There is a structure in uh, well, poetics basically. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah poetics. it's Aristotle's poetics, and you know he he was the first one who uh, said that a story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and we get our three act structure from that. Now, what's what's interesting there is a lot of people say, well, that's just common sense or whatever. But that was not how stories were being told before then. Really, they were being told in two act structures. Um, and, and if you go see a play today, most plays still have two acts. So the idea of telling a, a story in three act structure was pretty revolutionary because it, it used to be that a single actor would be on the stage with a comedy mask or a tragedy mask. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you would basically have the actor, you know, portraying uh, the, this story all themselves. And then we had a Greek tragedian who who writes this idea of adding a, uh, a second actor to the mix mm -hmm. and, and having two actors, one that wears the comedy mask and one that wears the tragedy mask. And then we have another Greek tragedian that adds this idea of the Greek chorus who, who stand up behind the actors and they sing uh, what's happening sort of in the backstory. All these developments allowed us to start being able to tell more and more complex stories. Mm -hmm. We could have never gotten to uh, something like the Avengers, you know, um, which is this long, long mm -hmm. epic story that without – um, advancing incrementally into how stories are told in more and more complex ways. You know, the Avengers is tremendously complex. And sometimes we like to say, well, yeah, that's the way a story should be told. But it took <laughs> processes for us to get there in order to have these multi-hour stories that audiences could follow. So I, I think Aristotle was really on to something I, and, and let me just also say, and I'd be interested to know, you know, how you feel about this. Mm -hmm. You're someone who lives in this world. Um, I feel like, you know, oftentimes um, it's become sort of in vogue to sort of trash uh, any ideas about structure in, mm -hmm. in modern storytelling. I, I would say this, though, um, you know, it, it's not about formula, but it is about form. Writers are the only group of artists that really trash the idea of structure sometimes. You never have musicians that come in and say, you know, I'm going to write a song and I'm going to create a new chord that no one's ever heard before. I'm yeah. going to not use the chords and in, in notes. You never have a, an artist that comes in and tries to create new colors that no one's ever seen before. You never have an architect that says, I'm going to design a house with no floor and no ceiling and no windows and no walls. Uh, you know, but it doesn't mean that every painting looks alike. It doesn't mean that every song sounds alike or that every house is looks alike. 
I think we have to understand that structure is necessary for us to be able to build something that resonates with an audience. Um, but it doesn't mean it's the only form of storytelling out there. Mm -hmm. There are stories that just explore uh, the, 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 uh, a character, who a character is, and trying to get down deep into that. But I think sometimes we like to just throw paint up on the wall in, in whatever sticks. We say, well, that's what I meant to do. I'm just I'm not going to be bound by these things. And sometimes I think it's laziness more so than anything else. But I, I'd be curious to know what uh, what your take is on that. I, I, I have strong feelings about this because I've I, because writers in general are or screenwriters specifically anybody. It's not like I, I listen to uh, John Williams score and I say, oh, I can go do that because I listen to it. Yeah. Uh, and it's the same thing for filmmakers and screenwriters. Like, oh, I watch movies. Oh, I read a screenplay. I guess I can go do that. There, there, there's not – it's it's like the, the level of entry or the barrier to entry is so low for screenwriters, meaning that you could just – you need a laptop, final draft, and an idea and some yeah. basic understanding on how to, how to structure or format a screenplay. And you're automatically a screenwriter. And yeah. it's not that. And when I see when I see filmmakers or screenwriters start saying, "Oh well, oh structure or that save the cat thing or all this kind of stuff um, is not good," I look at it differently in the sense that I feel that that a lot of that's insecurity because yeah. it's insecurity and it's ego in their own mind because they're like, "I can do it better. I don't need structure." I'm like, "You yeah. do need man. You need a blueprint to build a house, man. And not every house looks the same." That's right. You know, it's the bottom line. You just need a blueprint. And that blueprint can change dramatically. You know, That's you right. could have five doors in the front of the house if you want to. And and the bathroom could be on the roof. It's yeah. fine if you want to yeah. do that. But <laughs> you still need to have the rules of the game in yes. order to play. And I think structure allows you to do that. I When I write, I love structure uh, dramatically because it's, it's like – up, uh, it's like uh, mile markers for me on yes. where I can like put things and structure, and I can move those mile markers when I want to, uh, but they're there, you know, and they just kind of like okay, here I can hang my hat on this, I can hang my hat onto that, and so on. And I think it, it's so important for 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 screenwriters to understand that structure is not an enemy; it's yeah. a, it's actually a friend of yours. And and when you look at these stories like um, Joseph Campbell's, you know, work. And the hero's journey, like, look, we all know, anyone listening to this should know the hero's journey. The basic, yeah. it has been beaten and beaten and beaten to death ever since Joseph Campbell came up, uh, or at least presented it to the world. It had already been there. Yeah. He just packaged it and, and presented it to the world. We yeah. all know a variation of the hero's journey. Yeah. Is the hero's journey for every single story? I don't think so. I don't, I mean, right. try to throw the hero's journey on a detective story. It's going to be right. really tough. That's right. You know, it's a really tough scenario. Yeah. So, well, and what you're saying there is so important because it, uh, Joseph Campbell wrote this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, in 1949, right? Long time ago. Um, it, it was meant to describe these things that he saw. I uh, am someone who believes right now um, we, we could do well to take an interest in some of the other things that Joseph Campbell wrote about. And one of the things he wrote about is alchemy. And it's a really interesting part of the study of mythology to look at alchemy. And I am working on some theories right now around storytelling alchemy, mm -hmm. because alchemy was this practice basically of turning lead into gold. Mm -hmm. It was this process, you know, that, that these magicians and chemists and religious people. Wizards. Would, yeah, sure. Wizards. Yeah. They would, they would try and take these elements and combine them in order to make gold. So I, I've sort of got this theory that I'm working on that I'm calling uh, storytelling alchemy. And what it is, is basically taking narrative elements and combining them in order to create something different. The, the best example that I could make is if you took um, uh, a, a glass vase and you filled it full of every Thing we know about story, everything we know about developing characters and about three-act structure and five-act structure for television and every uh, uh, aspect of symbolism and everything we know about story, if you put it in a glass vase and then dropped it on the ground and it shattered into a million pieces, 
And let's say we took all those different pieces and we created uh, a mosaic on the wall of something beautiful, a new art form. That I think is what we're seeing right now with a lot of short form video, with a lot of long form storytelling through these streaming services. We're seeing people take uh, you know, value in all these elements from character. Like people have, have studied in depth how characters should develop and psychology of characters. And people are taking elements of uh, of three act structure, but they want to, you know, put put a twist on it uh, and, and make it sort of episodic in nature. And we're taking all these elements and we're creating a new mosaic of something that's beautiful that people enjoy, but it still has all these elements that we know to be true about storytelling. And so I, I think it's it's a form of alchemy where maybe all we're doing is we're taking elements that we know about what makes a character work and, and we're combining that with audience agency and creating something like Bandersnatch, which was mm -hmm. the Black Mirror, you know, mm -hmm. uh, spinoff movie that allowed the audience to make decisions and have mm -hmm. agency. And, and I think. You know, something like that. How do you tell a three act story in something where the audience has agency, which is, you know, an experimental thing that's going on with storytelling? Well, we still can take these narrative shards that we pick up off the broken glass and create a new mosaic. And it's still got the elements. They just may not be in the same order that we've experienced them before. You know, I think that you bring up a very good point. I mean, you wrote a book, obviously, called The Masters of the Cinematic Universe, which talks about transmedia. And I, I do think that there is a lot of opportunity for writers because a lot of writers listening right now, a lot of screenwriters are all stuck in the same old school way of telling stories. And I, and I don't say that in a derogatory more, but like just a standard, you know, legacy, meaning screenwriting, yeah. writing a novel, writing a book, you know, those kind of storytelling vehicles, uh, television and so on. But now there is so many multiple ways that you can write and tell stories in all of these other platforms. Uh, before we get into that, though, can you tell me in your definition what is transmedia? Because it is a word that is thrown around. It was kind of like uh, – what was that back in the day? Um, multi – oh, God. What was that word? Um, like with CD-ROMs and um, – oh. Multimedia? Multimedia, yes. That was like <laughs> multimedia player and multimedia. Yeah. Like it was one of these all like these token <laughs> words that like thank God it's gone. But yeah. but it was like one of these things, like it's a multimedia thing. And like yeah. transmedia has turned it into something like that. So can you explain exactly what yeah. transmedia is? Absolutely. And transmedia, you're right. It's become a buzzword and it's sort of grown to a point where people just don't even really know what it is. The, the original idea behind transmedia is that you could create a story that could move between mediums and platforms. Now, a great example of this is what we've seen uh, with with the stories of, say, Spider-Man or the Avengers or uh, Batman. We, we started with these stories being told through the medium of comic books, right? Then we saw these stories being told uh, through video games and through movies and through television shows. And basically, these same stories are able to move between mediums. And that's really what transmedia storytelling is, is creating a story that's able to be expressed uh, regardless of what medium it is. It's sort of something that came out of um, the, the explosion of technology that allowed us to start telling stories in a lot of different ways. And some people, somebody would come up with a really good idea for a story, they would go in and pitch it, and an executive might say, you know, that's a really good story. Our film slate is really full right now, but maybe we could we could, you know, tell that through the medium of television or maybe we should send that story over to our video game division. Mm -hmm. And so people began trying to create stories that would be powerful and be impactful regardless of the medium that they were expressed in. Now. On one hand, this is great because we're, we, we have more ways to tell and express a story. On the other hand, people begin to ignore the fact that every particular medium actually has rules and, and has form that, that helps that story work best. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So it's it's not possible really just to take a story that would be a feature film and just plug it in as a television show. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you've got to recraft it. You've got to recraft it for the medium in a way that makes it work. Now, television even has really changed dramatically since we've had all these streaming services come into play. Now people binge watch shows. So it's not about trying to end a story every week in a place that brings the audience back to see it the next week because people can binge the show and just watch the next episode right away. Um, So, you know, we we have to look at these various mediums and, and try and understand how we express any good story idea through the form of that medium. And that's really what the book Master of the Cinematic Universe is about, is trying to look at those forms and say, okay, if you have a good story idea, how are you going to then pour it into the appropriate shape, the appropriately shaped uh, glass in order Mm -hmm. for the audience to want to drink it? Yeah, it's kind of like... It's kind of like video game movies. Yes. Like they're I, – I can't – I'm sure there's one or two that are good, but the majority of them are horrendous. Horrendous. Because they're, because they're trying to take the medium of, from a video game and, and plop it into a narrative feature film. And it's just very difficult because it's just different – You know, the storytelling in a video game is massive and in scope. And you can go a thousand different directions and to try to jam that all into an hour and a half – yeah. is it's difficult it's extremely yeah. difficult i mean can you recommend do you remember a video game movie that was good you, you know maybe uh maybe you know there was something i liked about the most recent tomb raider uh there were some things i liked about that yeah it's not a great movie no um, but but I tell you, I've had more bad experiences than good. I really, you know, saw the trailer a year or so ago for Assassin's Creed, and I thought, oh, oh man, it looks, looks so, so good. good. No, I know. And the movie was no. one of the worst I've no. seen on the screen. No. Just, no. And how do you get Michael Fassbender? You know, know. In, he looked in, great. He looks. I know. I know. It, was, it looked, looked fantastic. It was horrible. <laughs> so now, so. So this brings us into something else, and and I know we're gonna we're walking on landmines on this next co- this next conversation. I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, <laughs> so you work for you've worked with um, Vertigo Comics, mm-hmm. all right. Which uh, for everyone listening, Vertigo Comics is is kind of it's part of the DC universe. Right. And I've always said that Vertigo uh, is a wonderful. I mean, what they do with their storytelling is fantastic. They uh, they made movie uh, movies were based on their books like Watchmen and V for Vendetta. And uh, a handful of other ones as well that are really, really good. And uh, that side of the DC universe, I have ut- utmost respect for. But there's another side of the DC universe <laughs> that is not the Chris Nolan Batman, right, right, or or the Tim Burton Batman, or any standalone Batman movies. Let's right. just throw it out there generally, um, or the original Supermans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> other than those ex- ex- exemptions. The DC universe has been a colossal failure, in my opinion, and I know people are gonna. I've, look, I did a whole YouTube video about this. <laughs> I don't care if it made money. I don't. I'm not a fan. I, you know, I, I, there's yeah. elements of it that I do enjoy. I'm mm-hmm. a comic book guy, like everybody yeah. else. But there's been a lot of failures there. And and look, and I'm not the only one to say this. Everyone right. has said it. Even Warner Brothers is like. Okay, right. we 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 just can't. Wonder Woman actually was actually I enjoyed Wonder Woman very much, yeah, so, and so. I thought I thought Aquaman was fun, probably mm-hmm. one of the more fun ones. I think they could yeah. have let let uh, Jason Momoa loose a little bit more, but they kind of held them back. But that's just me. Um, we're geeking out, guys, but we are going to get to story in a second. Yes. I want, in your opinion, what is the difference and why the DC universe's way of of cinematic universe has failed so epically, um, yeah. you know, because Suicide Squad, just atrocious. Um, yeah. But arguably one of the greatest trailers I've seen in the last 20 years, yeah. uh, <laughs> with, <laughs> with, without question. How, they're, how they've been able to fail so epically with arguably three at least of the most iconic mm-hmm. superheroes mm-hmm. ever created, Wonder mm-hmm. Woman, Batman, and, and Superman. And mm-hmm. yet... Marvel, who's mm-hmm. lost most of their A-level guys and girls mm-hmm. through bad business dealings back in the day. They lost Spider-Man and X-Men and all these <laughs> other properties. And uh-huh. they came in with 
and please everyone just stand, just calm down before I say it. <laughs> they came in with B level characters, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. as far as Iron Man, Thor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been a Marvel guy all my life. Those yeah. are not A level characters. They're not right. like they weren't selling off like Fantastic right. Four. You know, well, not Fantastic Four, but but Thor, Iron Man, um, Captain America. These characters were not huge character they were popular yeah. and stuff but they were not best selling. so they were able to bring that and they've done this insane run of 11 i think 11 years now and created this yeah. insane yeah. marvel universe that now as we just recorded this end game came out a couple weeks ago and is now broken they're the second highest rate uh, the second biggest movie of all time and it will become the biggest movie of all time because it was it got yeah. to that point in less than two weeks um, there's a reason yeah. why people are so attached and it's not just visual effects. It's not just spectacle. Yeah. There's something yeah. so deep in story. Please, yeah. in your opinion, what made yeah. Marvel work as opposed yeah. to DC? And then I'll give you my, my Hubble opinion as well. <laughs> okay. Well, as you mentioned, this is definitely riddled with landmines. And so <laughs> I'm going to do my best here to a not lot, step on one. A lot of, a lot of hate mail is going to, a lot of hate email is coming. I can, I can see it already. Right. Um, I I think there's a couple of things. One, I I do think the point that you make about Marvel really built their success, their recent success on characters that were not their A-list characters. Mm -hmm. um, I think that has a great deal to do with it, actually, because expectations for Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, the expectations for those characters, the backstory, the mythology behind those characters is so ingrained in the the audience's mind, we have such a a strong psychological idea of what those characters do and what types of stories they can be involved in. It makes it like walking a tightrope trying to tell, uh, especially uh, stories on the big screen about those characters. I think we've seen, you know, the the Batman universe and the Superman universe work really well, actually, in the the television market. Smallville, I thought, was a really good show. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, but with Marvel, you know, you have basically the people who went in to see these Marvel films for the most part didn't have a lot of expectations, didn't have a lot of backstory or knowledge about how Iron Man became Iron Man about uh, you know anything more than the, than the Hulk maybe used to be a scientist. Maybe they knew that, maybe they didn't. Um, but for the most part, Marvel was able to build their current mythology around these characters from the ground up in the mind of the audiences. And I think that was a lot easier task to pull off than what DC faced. Also, the nature of DC characters versus Marvel characters from a storytelling perspective um, is is challenging because basically with DC characters, and this is not all of them, but for the most part, DC characters are born with the gift, right? They're born with the supernatural power. Superman, he's born with it. Wonder Woman, she's born with it. Green Lantern, born with it. Um Marvel characters, for the most part, receive the gift through some sort of of, uh, mistake in technology. Mm -hmm. They usually, you know, are regular people that are endowed with this gift, and it usually involves some sort of uh, uh, diabolical thing that happens with technology. I think that idea of our technology um, being something that, that damages us, that we have to then overcome, is something that really resonates with people psychologically in this day and age. We recognize that we're giving up something by giving away all our privacy and giving away all our time to our cell phones. These are things that we know we have great advantages for, but we also know we're giving up something, but we'd like to think we're still gonna win in the end. And so I think the Marvel mythology really speaks to that and plays to that. That's just one guy's humble opinion. Please don't at me on Twitter about this. Uh, but I, that's one guy's opinion of why I think um, we may have seen a lot more success, uh, at least in the cinematic universe with Marvel. Now, do you do you uh, would you agree that? And this is what I've this has been my theory about about this. And we won't go on this for another hour, I promise. Um, but I, I've always felt that DC's characters are all essentially gods. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they're all godlike in their own yeah. way. So Green Lantern is essentially a god in his powers. So is Wonder Woman. Yeah. So is Superman. So is Martian Manhunter. Um, yeah. You know, other than Batman, who I've always argued to state that is a Marvel character in the DC universe because he <laughs> he was in, he was a normal guy that got endowed by the technology and had to deal with his stuff. Um, yeah. You know. You know, as Thor is a god, but a very non godlike yeah. god. Like he has weaknesses. Yeah. He, these other ones, they're just so hard to write for. Like I remember re- watching a documentary on Su- on Superman, and they were like, "Yeah, we get to a point where Superman blew out a star yeah. with his yeah. breath. Like, where do you go from that? You know, like yeah. there's nothing. Like on a just narrative standpoint, where's the conflict? It's it's harder to write for those characters. Would it you is. agree? I would completely agree. It's it's tough when we're dealing with gods. This is why, by the way, in mythology, when the Greek gods, you know, uh, were were created by the Greeks uh, to tell, you know, they told stories about them. They are all really imperfect gods. Uh, that, that's the reason their stories that have endured forever is actually their projections of human beings on different aspects of who we are. Mm-hmm. The Greek gods are more like human beings than the humans in the Greek mytho- mythological stories. And so I think that's one reason I think uh, also people have gravitated towards uh, Marvel in this day and age with the with the films has been Iron Man seems more like a guy you'd like to go get a beer with mm. than Superman or Batman. You know, we we they seem yeah. more like us, <laughs> seem more relatable. Uh, they're not so much the projections of, of who we want to be on our best days, like Batman and Superman. So that's you know, interesting. It, it, and that said, I love Batman, Superman. Oh, I, I, I actually prefer the DC characters more than the Marvel characters. But there's no denying the success that Marvel has had at the box office. And I would agree with you. Like, I would not want to have a beer with Batman, but I would definitely want to have a beer with Tony Stark. Like, there's just no, you know, Batman's going to be brooding about things. You know, he's just <laughs> he's just an angry dude. Uh, but I'm a huge Batman fan. You know, that's why I love what Nolan did with Batman and Dark Knight, arguably, arguably the best superhero movie ever made, in my opinion. Okay. You know, um, with Logan coming up, Probably real close second, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're just you know they're just at a different playing field. I enjoy the Avengers, I enjoy all those, but there's just there's something really deep in those other movies. Um, For sure. Yeah, it, it's 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 a very interesting topic, and I'm sure we could we could have a whole episode <laughs> on Marvel DC. And and one last thing before I finish on the Marvel DC <laughs> thing, I have to, I just have to. Okay. In your opinion as well, do you believe that? You know, DC, I felt like DC was trying to mimic or copy or catch up with this kind of false, like, race that they were with with Marvel. Marvel had, like, a five-year head start on them building this universe, and they're just trying to jam everything in, where yeah. if they would have taken their time and done – literally just – they could have done the blueprint. They yeah. could have literally stolen the blueprint from Marvel and just – Build it out little by little, then do the Justice League, then yeah. bring in maybe Suicide Squad. Then, like, it, it was laid out for them, but they were just yeah. in such a rush. Yeah. Do, was, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I do. And I, I think this is actually just to loop it back into story. Um, I think this is something that writers and storytellers really can learn a valuable lesson from mm-hmm. because many of us have a great idea for a, a, a story or a, a, you know, a scene, and we're quick to sort of get that into our story, and then we get into like the second act or the third act, and we really sort of have our characters just sort of wandering around because we've, we've done this big thing we wanted to do. And so I, I think there's always a temptation uh, to, um, to, to not appropriately pace our storytelling. And I think that's what we saw with DC on a, on a great level. And I think you and I would both also agree as storytellers, pacing is hard to master. Mm. It's really difficult. In mm-hmm. a story, pacing is one of the hardest things to do. And I think we even see, you know, the big boys fail at this when, oh, uh, okay. uh, yeah, they they try sometimes because it's hard to do. Yeah, there's there's no question, and I always I always tell people too, it's like just because you have two hundred million dollars doesn't mean you know what you're doing. It's 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 it's, it's, it's like going up to the bat, like 
just because you're Babe Ruth doesn't mean you're going to hit a home run every time. That's right. You know, right. it's just an expensive swing at the bat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very expensive swing at the bat. Um, yeah. So well, it's, th- this sort of actually, if, if you uh, allow me one more divergence sure. here, I, I think it's something that um, uh, actually is a helpful uh, thing for writers to in storytellers to consider right now is you know it, it is a big swing at the bat every time we devote ourselves to you know writing 120 pages you know for a story or uh, writing you know a, a TV pilot um, I, I think because every swing of the bat is so expensive um, one of the things I'm finding right now I think that writers really can be doing as a favor to themselves, is becoming as diverse as possible in their storytelling ecosystem. So I'm working on a book right now called The Creative Ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And here's sort of my idea. My life got so much simpler a few years ago when I stopped trying to narrow myself down to one single job description. Mm-hmm. When I would get on an airplane and people would ask me what I would do, uh, it was tough because I, I'd say, well, I, I'm, I'm a writer. I write books and I write screenplays, but I also am a teacher and I'm also a, a speaker. And sometimes I, 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 I go and I do story consulting for studios. And, you know, it, it was tough uh, to describe. And Alex, when I finally got to a point where I stopped trying to narrow my job description down to a single title and embrace my work as this ecosystem built around story, Mm -hmm. my life got a lot simpler. So some days I get up and I'm in the mountains of screenwriting and I have Mm -hmm. highs and lows and it's wonderful. Some days I'm in the deserts of 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 speaking and I'm out in front of people and it, it, it it's tough and it's dry and my my throat needs water and some days I'm in the swamps of of story consulting and it's mushy and it's messy and I've I've found out just like a real ecosystem I as a creative person have to constantly have new rivers and streams coming into the ecosystem. I also have to have things going out of the ecosystem, waste going out. That story that I keep coming back to, that I, I, I just keep wanting to tell, sometimes you gotta just let that script go and let that be waste that goes out of the ecosystem. And so I'm working on this book right now that uh, is meant to encourage writers living in the gig economy, you know, where a lot of us are driving Uber or, or driving Lyft um, or doing DoorDash. And we have seven different things we're doing in order to make ends meet and make a living. And writer, writing may just be one of those things. But managing your life and managing your creative work is an ecosystem just like we have here on the planet, bringing new streams in, bringing things out, uh, uh, having forests that I go and I meditate in and I sort of just stay in my, my, my research place. Having a beach on your ecosystem that is just where you go for fun and, and you don't got to worry about you know work at all. But having all those things as part of your creative ecosystem, I feel like is one of the most significant ways that writers can approach their creative life right now. And again, I think it's a lesson we're learning from big companies like Marvel and DC. They've had to expand their ecosystems. If if DC were only trying to tell stories through movies right now, if they didn't have video done, games done. and comics, they'd be done. Well, we as writers need to take a lesson from that and need to say, okay, how can I develop my ecosystem where if my scripts aren't paying the bills right now, what are other areas that I can be writing in, that I can be doing in order to form a creative life that's meaningful? That is fantastic. That is a fantastic idea for a book. It is. I've never heard it put that way before. So I am excited to read that book uh, when it comes out, and I'm sure everyone listening is too, because it's it's so true. Like you, I, I I have so many hyphenates. It's not even funny. Like I have so many hyphenates in my world. Like what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm a blogger. I'm a podcaster. I'm a director. I'm a writer. I'm a. I, I do post, I do this. It just keeps going on and on. So it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. But I love the concept of coming in and going out. The going out for creatives is probably the toughest prob- problem because you That's hold tough. on to that script that you spent a year of your life on. Yep. 
but you really just need to take uh, some x lax and just let it go. <laughs> just let it go. Loosen the bowels and let that go because it's not going there. It's just stopping you up. I'm sorry. Right. I don't mean to be crass, but it is, but it's a great analogy because as creatives, I've done it in my life. I'm sure you have too. You hold on to something, but you're like, but I've spent so long on this movie or I've spent so long yeah. on this script and I got to hold on to it because if not, that year I just went through is a waste. Yeah. And I would I would argue that the year that you just went through is not a waste, even if the product might not make it. The education right. you got, the experience you got is invaluable. And you learn much more about yourself and about everything when you fail than when you win. You, you, win not, right. you, you learn nothing from the wins. That's right. Do you agree? I completely agree. And that's – that's why if you look at your work as an ecosystem, in order for the ecosystem as a whole to stay healthy, mm -hmm. you need those outputs. You need to be disposing of the waste because that is what's going to keep the whole ecosystem healthy and, and to be able to say, you know what, that waste that I'm letting go of, it's there because there was work put in that strengthened some other part of the ecosystem. You know, right. so that when I'm in the forest just doing research and I'm just thinking through my story ideas and I, I'm working on outlines and working on, you know, that is not wasted time. We mm -hmm. tend to think that, you know, uh, it, it's only the time setting in front of the computer at the keyboard, you know, that is is actual writing. Man, most of my writing occurs when I'm in the car driving through the streets of L.A. It, and it occurs. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I mean, that's yeah. where my writing happens. When I get to a keyboard, it's just a matter of getting to put it on the page. But the writing actually her, uh, occurs when I'm out on the 405, you know, driving uh, to, to the next thing I have to do and learning to value that, learning to say, you know what, this is valuable time. And even if I have to let this go later, there's nutrients I've taken from this process that have made me a more healthy writer and my entire ecosystem has been strengthened because of the work I did on this project. It's a much better way to live, man, than feeling like you're just failing all the time. Yeah. And, and if you can, uh, you know, like I'll use my my career as an example. I've always I started off as an editor, and then when editing work started to slow down, I jumped into color grading because I saw that there was less co traffic there or less competition. So they started color grading. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Then I'll just also do post supervising because I essentially know how to do that anyway. And then I'm like, well, VFX supervising is just another step ahead of that. So I'll just do VFX supervising as well. And I'm also going to direct while I'm directing. So you, you're always finding something. So if, if I'm not working in one thing, I'm working in another. It's diversification of yeah. your creative process where it is so it's it's like putting all your eggs it's like when you're investing you don't invest only on e-toys that's right that's right yes <laughs> you know you don't only invest in sears stock yes. you know because <laughs> things are not going to go well you need to diversify your creative portfolio and and by doing multiple different things i'm a screenwriter i'm a writer i'm a novelist i'm a blogger i write articles i do this you're constantly working and you're also constantly strengthening all of those muscles. I, would you agree? Man, Alex, you nailed it. You nailed it. That's exactly what, in my opinion, finding success in this business, that is the key. You know, it, it is about trying to diversify, to have a healthy ecosystem of work um, that, that is going on. Um, that's really the key to success for me. And, and does that mean you're going to, you know, be hired to direct the next Marvel movie or whatever? Maybe that'll become part of your ecosystem and maybe it won't. But the, the, the thing is, if that's your only goal that you're trying to hit is I just want to be able to direct a Marvel movie. That's such a thin line and a thin <laughs> goal line. Um, you know, you're, you're not setting yourself yeah. up for success, you know. So to me, the, that's sort of the beauty in, um, um, you know, people like yourself who are able to be these human Swiss army knives, right? That it's like, hey, whatever you need done, I can step in and I can do it. I, I'm somebody who gets things done. In some ways, to me, Alex, that builds the sort of psych psychology that's necessary for successful success in the entertainment industry, is being somebody who embodies the Swiss Army knife and says, you know what, whatever they need done, 
I can do it and I can do it well. I'm going to step in and I'm going to learn that craft in order to uh, bring some success to that. That's the psychology that, uh, that that's going to get you places in this industry. Would you agree that the olden – or not the olden, the legacy way of doing things in this industry have been like – the movie industry did not change for 80 to 100 years. It was pretty right. much – that was it. It that did not. It. it did not move. I mean, from the technology of how movies were made, sure, little things here and there, but it was film and it went through the process. And and writing, you were a screenwriter, and that's it. So that focus of oh, I can only be a screenwriter as a writer in the business. That was it. In yeah. today's world, things are changing so dramatically that right. w- and you know, and jobs are being dis- just gone. Like you know, <laughs> uh, it's like you know, for lack of a better word, like I'm a coal miner, and all of a sudden, that's all I've done all my life, and all I know is coal mining. And I right. and guess what the mine's closed now because it, 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 whatever yeah. reasons it's done. Yeah. And now they're like, well, I don't have any, I don't know any, how to do anything else. That is the old way of thinking. Where in That's the right. new economy, in the new entertainment industry, you need to be a jack of all trades. Specialization yeah. is is you're you're risking when you do specialization right. uh, because. You know, in the world that we're living in, things are changing so rapidly that all of a sudden, like, oh, you know what? We don't need directors anymore. AI is taking care of that for yeah. us. But we also do need this. I don't think yeah. that's going to happen, but um, <laughs> right. unless James Cameron creates it. But um, but but there's, it, it happens all the time. And I saw it in – I came up, like I said, as an editor. When I came up, there weren't a lot of editors, and editing systems used to cost, you know, $100,000, $150,000 to edit on nonlinear editing systems. Before that, it was a million dollars to have an editing suite. And then all of a sudden, Final Cut came out, and now everyone's an editor. So now the competition came in, so then that's when I jumped into color grading, because color grading was still a little bit higher up, and not everybody could do that. And then, But you kind of kind of always jump all yeah. over the place. Yeah. If you don't do that, you're done. That's it. That's it, man. I mean, I mean that's... We would love to romanticize this idea, you know, that uh, we we can just stay uh, committed to this one thing. And I do think it's good to have something that is really your focus and a goal Mm -hmm. that you're trying to get to. I'm all for that. Not saying don't do that. But what I am saying is if you want long term success in this business, you've got to adapt that sort of adaptability. Um, it, it's just like, you know, the industry is is changed. Um, we, we don't think about the way that the industry has changed throughout history. For example, it used to be when you went to the movie theater, there was a man that was or a woman that was paid to set up at an organ at the front and, and play music that accompanied what you were seeing on the screen. Right. And you know what? Overnight, that job disappeared. Gone. It was gone. And if that's and, all you've and, done, if that's all you've done for thirty years, you're you're done. That's right. That's you're done. And and so often, entire careers are gone overnight because that that was you know no longer needed. And that's the age we live in. I mean, think about you know when you and I were were young. If we wanted to go, sir, I, a, sir, so, sir, I, I'm still young, sir. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I'm speaking for myself for sure. For sure. I am twenty. Um, I am twenty five. My daughters have done this to me. Oh, I, you know what? It, I totally get it. I totally get it. I, I myself have been twenty nine for a number of years now. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you were saying, sir. Yes, but it used to be if you or I wanted to go to Florida we would call a travel agent and get them to book us a ticket to go to Florida. Right. Uh, That overnight, that entire industry disappeared, right? Mm Because we didn't need it anymore. So if you want to be someone that, you know, is putting all your eggs in one basket, you do risk this idea that, um, you know what, Uh, my, my career may be completely irrelevant overnight someday. But I think that's why those of us I, – I love that you know, your, your brand, your podcast, you know, Indie Film Hustle, because I think most of us recognize that one of the big keys to success here is to have a hustle, to, have, to be mm-hmm. hustlers. Um, that's why I have a lot of friends that are right all day, and then at 2 in the afternoon, they go out and they drive Uber for four hours, and then they go do DoorDash for four hours, and the gig economy necessi- uh, makes it a necessity that we have to be willing to be diverse in how we approach getting our art out into the world. 
Without question. And every single time I walk into an Uber, I sit down in an Uber, the first words out of my mouth is, how's the script? And yeah. they, and I, <laughs> cause I live in LA. So it's and about seven out of 10 times I go, how did you know? <laughs> I don't. I'm not making fun. I'm not. You know what? I'm. I'm. I'm just ribbing. But yeah. the, but it's, but it's the thing. And if it's not a if it's not a, a screenwriter, it's an actor. And if it's not an actor, it's a director. If not a singer, I, I was in an Uber the other day. They sh- they played me their demo. Yep. Their yep. demo was being played for me in their in their. I'm like, and they're like, can you give me options? I'm like, opinions. I'm like, do you want the truth? Yeah. Um, and because I'm never gonna see you again. So if you want the yeah. truth, I'll tell you the truth. And I did. And you could see that they're just like. I'm like, yeah. it's, I'm like, you need more production. You need more of this. This is like, you know, all of a sudden I'm an American Idol judge, yeah. but this is, but this is the world that we live in right now. And it is, it is, it's tough, but I think that Swiss army knife analogy is exactly what we all need to be, especially just on the writing standpoint, there is hundreds of different things you can do as writers. I know professional screenwriters who, who have jumped into novel writing yes. because they keep 100% control of their story. And yep. they don't have to deal with all the, the crap that goes along with trying to produce a feature film. Um, and, then, and I want to touch on real quick virtual reality because that is something that you wrote a big a book on that was very popular. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, the possibilities for writers in virtual reality and yep. where that, that whole industry is going to go? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you bring it up because it really is a, a, a big part of my ecosystem right now. It's a new stream that's come in. And I, I've always sort of been interested in technology. I've been interested in cameras and post-production um, at, at various times. Um, when virtual reality first started to rise into prominence uh, this most recent time, I, I recognized that, that the language that we could tell stories with, with this medium, was really going to be different than anything we had had experienced before. Part of that is because for the last uh, 100, 120 years, we've been using the edges of a frame to tell an audience, here's what's important, here's what is not important. If it's outside the edges of the frame, don't worry about it. I will tell you as the storyteller what to pay attention to by centering it up somewhere near the center of the frame. I will show you what it is that I want you to see. With virtual reality, we've removed the edges of the frame and we have have put the audience in the role of the protagonist. But I would suggest to you that no technology has really taken off and succeeded on, on a mass level until we figured out how to tell a story with it. Film cameras, Thomas Edison, when he first developed the film camera, only used them for scientific purposes. He predicted the failure of of using a film camera to tell stories with. Now, he was greatly wrong about that. But once we figured out how to tell stories with cameras, um, that technology takes off. Television takes off once we really figure out how to tell stories with it. Radio takes off when we figure out how to tell stories with it. Even, I would dare say, the Internet really took off once we figured out how to share our stories with it. My mother uh, has become a Facebook expert, and it's only because she wants to be able to share her stories and experience the stories of her grandchildren, Mm -hmm. right? So I I am convinced that um, we haven't yet figured out uh, how to tell good stories with virtual reality. It's sort of what the book that I wrote is about, but I'm convinced that uh, the ability to give the audience agency within a story is something that's not going to go away. This is a whole different medium outside of video games, outside of film. And just like with those mediums, it took us time to develop a cinematic language. It's going to take some time with virtual reality to develop a cinematic language. This gives an opportunity for writers, however, to help craft this new storytelling medium in a way that's never been done before. There is a lot of money in tech uh, that is being invested into trying to tell successful stories in virtual reality. So I would highly recommend that any writer who's looking to sort of expand their ecosystem start looking into VR as a medium to write for because a lot of what you know about story will apply in this new medium even as you figure out how to expand your storytelling abilities in a new cinematic language. Would you would you agree with the, the statement that 
that box that you were talking about that we've been trained and, and, and most humans have been trained to, to look at, even back in the Greek stage, like it was whatever was on the stage, basically. Yes. When you comp- when that box is now gone, is it a little overwhelming? Because I, I feel it's extremely overwhelming when I sit down with VR and I'm just like, oh my, it's just too much input. And I'm like, where do I go? It's like I'm not trained for it. And even – you know, I mean, maybe the generation coming up because they play video games in a kind of VR world where everything is all yeah. over the place. But at least for our generation yeah. and, and, and generations before, but even then, that's video game playing. That's not well, storytelling. Storytelling right. is still, yeah. I gotta, I have a, storytelling needs a storyteller. And that yes. storyteller is the one who's gonna tell you the story. When it's so yes. wide open, it, there is no, uh, back to the very beginning of this conversation, there is no structure. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem like it. Do you agree? Tell me what you think. Well, I think it's more nuanced than that. And, mm-hmm. and here's why. If you look back to the history of film, mm-hmm. when film first began to be displayed in these big motion picture houses, mm-hmm. there's a, a very famous old film clip of a cowboy pointing a gun yeah. directly yeah. at the screen and pulling sure. the trigger. Mm-hmm. And it's a very famous story. Audiences jumping up and running out of the theaters because they felt exactly the way that you feel about virtual reality. They felt like, oh, it's too overwhelming. It's too much information. It's too real. It was like when the train was coming in for the first time, people the thought train the train was going to run them over. Right. Exactly. Uh, so in some sense, it, it is because we're an audience. You and I have grown up with this this 2D medium this that we're not uh, allowed much agency in. And so for us, it does feel overwhelming. Um, however... I think as as younger audiences that have been immersed in the sort of video game storytelling that a lot of older people find very overwhelming, I think it's something that younger audiences are going to grow into. However, let me say this as well. Um, I I think this is back where my narrative shards idea comes into play, Mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily have to have a three-act structure in a VR experience. You may use elements that we know about character or elements that we know about symbolism or elements that we know about environmental storytelling in order to communicate a story where the audience is the protagonist. Mm -hmm. So... Again, I, do I think we've got it all figured out? No. But I think it also took us some time to figure out how to do it uh, with cinema. We, we didn't get that right for a number of years. And think about how long it took uh, the earliest, you know, Moy Bridges horse of running uh, before we, we got to the point where we have, you know, Marvel uh, Endgame. I mean, that is a, a long, long <laughs> way to go with storytelling. So I think we've got a long way to go, but I'm confident once we get rid of those big block headsets that mm-hmm. people have to put on their heads, uh, we probably won't even call it virtual reality anymore, mm-hmm. but I think people are interested in being immersed in a story in ways that they never have been before. So I think it's clunky. I think we're not quite there with it. But the writers who figure out how to tell an immersive story now in the same ways that immersive theater, theme parks, escape rooms have been succeeding with for a number of years, I think those storytellers will be at the forefront of, of this future uh, of storytelling that we, we're just figuring out how to – we're babies. We're just figuring out how to stand right now. But one day we'll grow into it. We'll be able to walk. We'll be able to run. And we'll be able to really experience something like we've never experienced before, I believe. So so it's going to get better than Lawnmower Man is what you're telling me? <laughs> it's going to get a little bit better than that? Nothing gets better than Lawnmower Man. <laughs> that, that movie is a classic, man. It's a classic. I love it. Uh, it was <laughs> I was in the video store working when that came out. And when that came out, your mind was like, what is this visual effects? Oh, my God. Like, it just. So good. Like, Jeff Fay, he Pierce Brosnan, what's going on? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I want to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. What advice would you yes. give a screenwriter um, or storyteller trying to break into the business today? I would would say that it's important you recognize that this game is a marathon and not a sprint. 
you, you've really got to be in for the long haul. And when you finally get your opportunity, and I, I feel like Hollywood in the entertainment business is this super long line of people and you wait your turn to get up to the front of the line. And if you've done all your work to perfect your craft, by the time you get up to the front of the line and get your shot, I really believe you'll make it. However, if you've wasted that time, uh, you know, and you didn't perfect your craft by the time you get up to the front of the line and get your shot, then yeah, you probably won't make it. So I think approaching everything you do as, as being uh, preparation for when you get your big shot, I think is very important. And the final thing I'll say on that is this, Alex, every other art form, artists are very comfortable with practicing their art form. So people that are learning to draw or paint, they practice, they sketch. Musicians, they practice, right? For whatever reason, filmmakers and storytellers feel like every little thing we ever do needs to be put up on YouTube for public consumption. It needs to have a grand premiere. We need to have a big party around it. And we're sort of immature in that way. Mm -hmm. I look at the vast majority of the writing and the, the, the films that I've done as being practice for something that I do want to share with the public. So I would say mature, prepare to mature yourself to a place where you don't need to take every single piece of work you do and put it up for public consumption as a, a you know celebration of your art. But practice and use your art form to practice in a way that when you really do have something you want to share, it is strategically put in front of an audience instead of just taking every little thing you crap out and put it on uh, YouTube or Vimeo for everybody to see. So that's the biggest advice I could give storytellers right now. I, and the, some of the best screenwriters I know, I, I always ask the question, like, how many scripts did you write before you sold one? And a lot of times it's 8, 10, 15, 20 because they just – that's a professional. Yeah, that's a, profe right. a professional that's will right. do that. And then and the, the professional will not write and spend five years on one screenplay. That's just that's not right. what a professional will do. That's so right. You have that's to just – you got to work. You got to uh, – I think it was um, – I think it was the the uh, the, the legend at Sheridan uh, who said <laughs> – <laughs> who said this, and I thought it was a wonderful analogy – when he starts writing, because they ask him, how do you write songs? He is an amazing songwriter. And he and they go, how do you, when you write songs? Because, you know, it's kind of like turning on, you walk into an old house and you go into the bathroom and you turn on the tub and you open, you open up the, the faucet in the tub and all you get is sludge. Yeah. And you just got all that sludge has to come out and come out and come out till eventually it starts clearing up, clearing up, and then you get crystal clear water. But you've got to go through the sludge. That's it. That's it, man. You got to get all the bad writing out before any good writing is going to come through. Amen. Now, can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? Yeah, I, I uh, would definitely say it's Joseph Campbell, The Hero with a Thousand <laughs> Faces. But I, let me also recommend one other book that's a little more um, uh, modern, and it's a book of fiction uh, for writers and storytellers. This, this, I think, is just a really great example of really simple but powerful storytelling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a book by a guy named David Schickler, and it's called Kissing in Manhattan. And it's a collection of short stories, an anthology, that all the short stories end up weaving together. David Schickler, probably most known, he sold an idea to Cinemax for a series called Banshee. And I, I thought Banshee was a great series, um, but David Schickler created and wrote that. But he had a, a book of short stories called uh, Kissing in Manhattan. And I always love to recommend that to writers and storytellers as just an example of, of really creative but simple characters and stories that really are powerful. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. I, I I feel like I could do a whole other podcast just talking about the lessons <laughs> that I've learned. Uh, but I, I think the, the biggest lesson that I've learned is this. Um, trying to chase what I you know think is popular or what other people uh, like um, as far as stories go, um, that is is the dog chasing its tail. And I've really learned, the, the weird little things that I nerd out about and geek out about, those passions 
are the things that I should be telling stories about. And those are the things that bring the juice of life to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've learned to, to really not be ashamed of the weird little things I'm interested in and and that I spend a lot of time in. So I'll give you a a brief example. Um, I am really fascinated by uh, this, this place called Hubert's dime museum And it was the last dime museum in the United States. It closed down in 1969. It was in Times Square in New York. And it was this this really just weird place. And I have read everything I could possibly read about it. And I have um, um, found every picture. I go on eBay all the time and buy things that were held there in the the museum. And what, what does that have to do with my work? Nothing. But it's something that I can geek out about and that I can and get deep into and that nobody else in the world likes but me. But it brings so much joy to me to have that and to not be uh, ashamed of that or not feel like, you know, that that's a waste of my time. Mm-hmm. Um, so find those little things in life that bring you the most juice and that bring you the most meaning and the most joy and, and make time for those things in your life because the rest of this stuff um, is great, but it comes and goes and you need those little things that are just yours. Now, what fear did you have to break through to get yeah. to where you are today? You know, I, I think, again, I could do a whole other podcast of all the fears <laughs> that I've had. But the, the two biggest fears um, that I've had are one, imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. I still to this day, and I've published five books on storytelling. And every time I get up on a podcast or, or get on a stage or submit a script, I still have this idea in the back of my head that it's like, today's the day they're going to figure you out that you don't know what you're doing. Today's <laughs> that day. Um, oh, you and, me, but you and me both, brother. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, seriously, it's like that imposter syndrome. I don't care how much success you have. And I've sat down with some of the biggest names in the business and they've told me they still have that. So I don't think it ever goes away. Um, but that and then the fear of what will other people think? Mm. Will other people think I'm, I'm not good? Will other people think I'm stupid or, or that my ideas are dumb? Um, that Those are the two big fears for me is uh, that imposter syndrome and then the fear of that everybody else knows what good is except for me. Yeah, that's that's definitely that's definitely two big ones you got to come over come across, and you've done very well. You've been, well, you right. don't sh- you don't show it, sir. You don't show it. I, I try, I try. I, I struggle with them all the time, but those are the fears I would say that I'm learning to battle and, and learning to overcome. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Yeah, man, that's a that's an easy one because I've thought long and hard about this on many occasions. Okay, uh, number uh, number three. For me is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Jeez. I will forever be uh, a result of, of that film. Um, it, it inspired much of my uh, interest in mythology that I went to pursue a PhD around. Uh, just last night, I watched Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I, I just so love good. going into that world, man. Oh. It, is, it is a big number three for me. Uh, number two is The Empire Strikes Back. Um, that film um, showed me that a dark story still could be full of hope and could be uh, a story that stay, that stories can stay with you for life. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that story has just never left me. And then number one is probably a lesser known film that a lot of people uh, may not have seen. It's an old Orson Welles film called The Third Man. Mm-hmm. And the yeah. Third Man is – it's one of my favorite uh, films. It's a dark noir film and it's its about a man that fakes his own death and the, the person who, who discovers this and tracks him down. And I, there's just something about that film that I can't fully articulate or put into words uh, that really speaks to me. And um, I love going back to watch The Third Man every chance I get. Awesome. Now where can people find you and more about your work? Yeah. The, the two big places. One, uh, please visit my website. It's tellingabetterstory.com. You can see a lot of my work there, read more about me, uh, get to all my social media channels. 
Uh, the other place I'm really active is on Twitter, and it's at John, J-O-H-N-K-B-U-C-H-E-R. So it's my name with my middle initial. And uh, I'm, I'm really active on Twitter and really enjoy connecting with people there. So uh, I look forward to seeing people on Twitter uh, or really any of the social media handles that you can find at my website, tellingabetterstory.com. John, man, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know we can sit here and talk for at least another hour or two uh, without question uh, about uh, just on the Avengers and DC alone. Uh, but uh, it's been it's been an absolute honor having you and, and a pleasure speaking to you uh, on the show. And you've dropped some amazing knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So I do truly appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs. I really, really had a great time talking to John and getting into the alchemy of storytelling with him. And again, if you want to get links to anything we talked about in this episode, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS050 for the show notes. And don't forget to listen to John's bonus episode on how to write and shoot a sex scene on Indie Film Hustle's podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 334. And if you haven't already, head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com, subscribe to the show, leave us a good review. It really helps the show out a lot. Thank you so, so, so much. And that is the end of episode 50 of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. Thank you again so, so much for all the support, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 